Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm really excited to spend some time this morning talking about production-ready environments uh, for Kubernetes. Um, I'm Kip Compton uh, from Cisco, and, and joining me uh, this morning uh, is Dr. Lars Daniker from SAP. We're going to be showing some of SAP's applications running in this environment, as well as my colleague Jeremy Oki, also from Cisco. So here's how we've structured the next uh, 55 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to start by uh, sharing uh, some information on a solution we announced just three weeks ago. It's all about Cisco, uh, uh, Kubernetes, and AWS, and how you can do that in a hybrid environment. Um, after that, Lars is going to come up, and he's going to show a live business application, the SAP Data Hub, running on top of that infrastructure, drawing data and processing information both on-prem and in a public cloud. So you can actually see that solution with a real live enterprise class application from SAP. After that, Jeremy's going to come up and he's going to actually d dive into the solution itself and demonstrate some of the nuts and bolts on how the Kubernetes is integrated across the two environments, how the identity and access management is uh, connected, how the container registries work together, and so forth. So to start with, I want to give you an idea of the impetus for the work that we've done and how we see the market and what kinds of customer problems we believe that these types of architectures will solve. I mean, I don't think these numbers are a big secret to anyone in this room, but they are some numbers from IDC, and it's helpful to look at some real data. Um, you know, 90% of enterprises, according to some work we did with IDC, um, expect uh, to have hybrid. And in fact, we've already started down the path for hybrid. And I think the reasons for this are, are many and varied. Um, we have lots of customers who've made investments on-prem that they want to take advantage of. We have some customers, depending on what part of the world they're in and what industry they're in, that have regulatory requirements that they may not be able to meet. And we have some customers um, who simply have uh, technologies on-prem that they need to access to deliver experiences for their customers and for their employees, um, and they need to be able to run that on-prem. Now, the 14% number is sort of interesting. This was another number from IDC, and it was basically looking at enterprises' cloud journey and how mature their cloud adoption model is. And we broke them into five categories with an optimized cloud strategy being the most sophisticated, the most mature strategy, really where just about everyone wants to be. And the latest number is only 14% of enterprises are there. Um, and the way I like to think about that is 86% are looking for solutions, looking for help, and trying to solve these problems. So it creates a tremendous opportunity, um, I think, to help solve problems. And you know, another part of the problem is that these have really been traditionally two different worlds. Enterprises need to connect these. It, developers want to be able to develop code that runs in either environment, but they're very different. And you know, each has their own strengths and weaknesses and different histories, um, and it's been fairly difficult to connect them. Um, but we believe that Kubernetes and containers creates a new technology base that's especially well-suited to solving these problems. That's why we focused, uh, along with our partner SAP, in this area. And in particular, uh, we see containers bringing a number of advantages. Uh, one is scalability. Another is portability. You know, container formats are standardized. Kubernetes is standardized. It's much easier to get commonality across multiple environments like on-prem and AWS. And then last but not least is speed. Uh, we're seeing developers developing more quickly using the container tool chains, and we're seeing deployments happening more quickly uh, giving the tools there. It's really a much uh, more advanced and fluid uh, technology. That said, there is uh, a bunch of complexity here. There's a reason that it's 14% of enterprises are where they want to be and not 90% or 100%. You know, scale is still a challenge. You know, how do you scale things up? How do you scale them down? How do you develop a security model that works across these varied environments? There's robust security in each environment, but how do you actually tie that together? Um, how do you have developers work across these different environments? And how do you develop quickly? Because really, cloud at this point is about transformation and speed and innovation. So if you lose that as you go to hybrid, uh, that's not going to work for most of our customers. Um, we believe that this is really impacting a lot of our customers' businesses. As we talked to them, they were really challenged here, where they, they, there were a few cloud-native applications, if you will, that they could develop and tap into the benefits, um, but many required access to that on-prem environment, and that was and the complexity was really holding them back. And that's why we announced the solution we're going to talk about, um, which we announced three weeks ago, which is the Cisco hybrid solution for Kubernetes on AWS. Um, it provides a secure production-grade uh, environment that ties the on-prem environment and the AWS environment together uh, to enable people to deploy these types of applications. And as we looked at what it would take 
to make customers successful in this environment, we identified a number of capabilities that were needed. Um, one was, of course, monitoring. You know, how, once you're in operations, how are you going to monitor what's going on across these disparate environments? I mentioned security already. How do you tie together the security so you have an end-to-end -end story? Likewise on management. You know, identity is really important because if you want to manage these environments as a common environment and be able to spin up and, and move data between them, you have to have some common touchstone in terms of identity and authorization to make that work. And then last but not least, perhaps not surprisingly, given that I'm from Cisco, was networking. Your know, customers consistently report that networking is one of the most challenging aspects of their hybrid deployments. Um, so this is a high-level view of the solution. We'll get into it in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Um, but we applied a bunch of enterprise-grade technologies that are already in wide deployment um, to this problem, integrated them, along with some very unique, uh, we believe, integration that we achieved between Cisco Container Platform, which is a Kubernetes environment on-prem, and Amazon EKS, which, of course, is a Kubernetes environment at AWS. And in particular, we integrated the identity and access management capabilities. Um, and this really gives people a much easier way of working across these two environments. Um, it really gives them, we believe, a unique opportunity to leverage EKS in the Amazon environment, which is really obviously optimized for AWS and is a no compromises solution on that side, along with Cisco Container Platform, which is really optimized for the on-prem environment, is a no compromises solution for that. Um, so two different environments optimized for very different uh, production uh, locations and dynamics, but with a common thread between them to enable easier operations. In terms of what's different here, um, what we've seen is, first of all, it is the first hybrid solution for Kubernetes on AWS, so a lot of people are pretty excited about that. Um, the consistent identity and authorization is, is pretty key in terms of spinning up services in the different locations. Um, the tools that are part of the solution enable our customers to manage their Kubernetes applications, obviously, but also their existing applications. And this is feedback we got from uh, IT ops teams uh, uh, across the board, whereas they're deploying more and more containerized applications, they still have their more traditional virtual machine-based applications. And they need common tooling because they're not getting more budget to run more different types of applications. In fact, they're trying to become more efficient and more agile. So the ability to manage existing applications as well as these new hybrid Kubernetes applications is key. And then last but not least, the enterprise class support uh, that Cisco can provide around this solution. This is very important, once again, for the operations teams. Being able to call uh, one number and have triage and have uh, enterprise class support to get things running if there's a problem uh, is very important. We also recognize there's a bunch of different stakeholders and, and people who need to work with this solution in a typical enterprise environment. I mean, we think there's something for each of them in this. Um, so for example, developers are obviously critical. Without them, we wouldn't have these apps. Um, and we believe giving them the ability to develop, for example, on-prem and de uh, develop in the cloud and deploy on-prem, for instance, is very powerful. We've heard that a lot of developers prefer to develop in the cloud even if it's going to run on-prem. Um, the ability to just simply develop more easily Kubernetes hybrid applications is pretty critical. For IT ops, it's that support and the fact that they're enterprise class tools that are already deployed. And then for security team, it's that end-to-end -end security and visibility. So that they can meet their obligations, um, but still allow the developers and the lines of business to charge forward and innovate with new applications. So here's some of the key functionalities of the solution. Um, you know, unified and secure networking is obviously a key part of this from our perspective. And that's accomplished using the um, Cisco Cloud Services Router 1000V, or CSR 1KV, um, which is a virtual router that runs in the AWS environment. It's in the AWS marketplace. It actually aligns with the on-prem networking environments uh, that our customers at Cisco have, which is, is quite a bit of the, of the market. And that gives them a consistent and secure way of connecting the network. And we have proactive security with StealthWatch cloud agents on both sides, both in the data center and at AWS on the EKS cluster, uh, so that we can provide consistent security uh, across both of those environments. We have secure provisioning of microservices and applications using the AWS Open Services Broker. Um, we have a single control plane across both these environments. The CCP environment on-prem actually manages and can spin up things in the AWS EKS clusters that are associated with it, giving people a single consistent control plane across those environments. We provide real-time performance analytics using a technology called AppDynamics, uh, which is an industry-leading application performance analytics tool. And really, when you combine all of these things together, you get a networking poli and policy enforcement across this that's aligned with what enterprises expect and may need 
uh, for security and compliance reasons. So with that, I'm really excited uh, to invite Lars uh, to the stage here to talk about the work that we've done together and to show uh, SAP Data Hub as a production application running on top of this solution. Hey, Lars, thanks for being Thank here. You. here. Thank you. So, wow, what a crowd. Thank you for showing that much interest to, to our topics here. And I'm really excited to show you now how an real enterprise application is running on this infrastructure stack that Kip was just introducing. So first of all, whom of you in this, this crowd here heard about the SAP Data Hub and this, let's say, relatively new product? One, oh, this makes me easy for you, for, uh, with you because I don't bore you too much. That's good. Perfect. So let's, let's have a small look what we try to solve with that from the enterprise level, right? So as Kip pointed out already, what we were seeing in the recent years is with the combination of cloud and on-premise systems is that the complexity of the landscapes we are seeing at customer sites is increasingly in a tremendous way. We even see between different kinds of departments within a company a disconnect in the data strategy. Just to give you one example, we have now the, on the left-hand side the research and development department. Right? So let's call them the fancy guys, the data scientists. They obviously, they do a lot in the cloud. Right? So they use machine learning in the cloud, they use data science in the cloud, and they use the capabilities that the cloud is basically giving in this area. But you might also have your sales and marketing department, especially the sales guys, they are a little bit reluctant with putting data in the cloud, right? Because it's, let's say, a company secret. And you still want to have then in a company some kind of an overarching strategy that spans across the entire company, because why? Maybe the data scientist is creating a very nice machine learning model that helps you predict in your sales. So you want that this research and development department has actually access to the data in the sales department. So it all starts already with the question in the company, what data do I have? Where is it stored? How can I access it? And who can access this data, right? This is already the start, and it goes even one step further. If in a company you're taking a business decision based on a machine learning model, and at the end of the year, an auditor is coming to your company. He just doesn't want to know only where, basically, the decision is coming from, but he wants to know what machine learning model was used, what data was used to train this machine learning model, how was the original data looking like, and how was the original data transformed. And giving this chain of evidence, giving this data governance aspect, this is already a first very important problem. The second problem was greatly introduced by Kip, right? It's not only that we are talking anymore about I have my complete business in the cloud, or I have my complete business on premise, but we mostly have now the combination of both technologies in one place, and this increases the complexity. And at the end, what we want to do, also what I was just giving as an example, we want to, what we, let's call it big data or modern data, right, machine learning, the sensor streams, and so on, we want to combine this area with data that is coming from enterprise systems, right? So an IoT sensor stream that is continuously providing data I want to combine this with the master data that I might have in a complete transaction system. And this is actually what we try to basically resolve with this product called SAP Data Hub that is requiring exactly such a technology and an infrastructure that was introduced by KIP. So in principle, you have to imagine now the Data Hub is a tool that sits in the middle between both worlds. On the left-hand side, you have the, let's call it SAP applications, some systems like SAP HANA you might know, or DBW system, or applications like Concur or Fieldglass. On the right-hand side, you have then the cloud services, and just some examples are mentioned here, that you would like to use in conjunction. And the Data Hub is now trying to build a bridge between those two worlds and bring it closer together in a way that you might not even see that you are working in two environments at the same time. Right? And we do this by, in the first place, having a very strong metadata management. So we connect all the different systems to a central catalog, extract the metadata from the data that is stored inside of those systems, and give a central way of reading what data is stored in your company, in which system, where does the system run, and what are the basic characteristics of this data. So we answer already with that the first question that we had in the beginning, where is what data stored and what quality, right? The second is then the orchestration aspect. So we try to build at the end pipelines. That's also the third point. Pipelines is some kind of a, imagine it like a, a execution graph built of small operators. An operator can be something from, you name it, small transformations like changing the date format from US to the EU date format until basically even applying a machine learning model, right? 
And now you can build basically those pipelines and with that an overarching orchestration between all systems. For example, a pipeline can say, read my data from my sensor stream, read the data from my transactional database to get the metadata, filter this data, join it together, and provide it to the cloud back for machine learning applications, right? And this also comes in with integration and gestion by saying, now the, the main task of this tool is basically to provide you with connectivity to all kinds of systems on the one hand side, and also to give developers the capabilities to develop your own connectors to any kind of system that might not be supported directly inside here. So what we are basically saying, if something is missing, no problem. What we need from you is we need a Docker container with two requirements. You need to read from standard in, and you need to write for, to standard out, and that's it. With that, you can then pull in any SDK that you want and read data from any source that you like to have. So when we came basically to the question, how are we running this tool? And how are we running this tool on-prem and in the cloud at the same time? We were quickly coming to the point that we need some kind of a good abstraction platform. And what we were seeing as this abstraction platform, we were finding Kubernetes as one of the, let's say, major tools in this area. So whom of you knows Kubernetes or has some OK, quite a lot of people. That's, that's very good. So for us, basically, this is a, was a very important decision because now we could say we, in principle, don't care anymore about the hardware we are running on. We can completely abstract from that. We can say to the customers, look, we need a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud, on-premise, or on both sides. And then we can run our completely containerized data hub inside of this environment. Right? So really coming to a cloud-native environment, even on-prem and in the cloud. So. Why should I now, as a company, even think about hybrid cloud? Does anyone have an idea? So what is the, the reason why I should not go only in the cloud or not go only on-prem? Why should I think about hybrid cloud? Anyone an idea? OK. So uh, typically, you have a custom data center in a lot of companies, right? And what they are doing there is, and that's basically the reason why you still want to be on-prem, you have business-critical enterprise data, right? And you know, a lot of companies, especially in the US, they are, don't care too much about it. We just move in the cloud. But when you look into Asia and Europe, they're a little bit more reluctant with respect to that, right? But still, those companies, they don't want to keep up, right? They want to still use those, let's say, uh, advanced services that you can only run in the cloud. Do you really want to have your machine learning cluster with a lot of GPUs running in your data center? Maybe, but maybe you also want to use the, uh, let's say, elastic scalable resources in the cloud. So you need a combination of both worlds to basically go ahead and advance strategy for your company. So how can we achieve this and what are basically the, the, the problems? So I already said we are running on Kubernetes, right? So we can run the data hub on premise. No problem. It's working. We can run it in, in the cloud. Again, in principle, no problem. We have the Kubernetes platform running here. But now comes the challenge. In the cloud, it's relatively easy. We have Amazon EKS, the managed Kubernetes service from AWS. Just a few clicks, just a few scripts, and you have your Kubernetes cluster running. You install the data hub, perfectly fine. One hour of time, and you have the whole thing running. No problem. But what about on-premise? Whom of you knows how to operate a Kubernetes cluster on-premise in a really enterprise-ready, scalable way? A few, OK, but much less than the people who know about Kubernetes at all. So even if you know how to manage it, it is, at least from also our experience, it is a challenge how to do this, right? So this is the first challenge that you have. If you want to have hybrid cloud and you want to go for Kubernetes-based applications, how are you managing the Kubernetes in the cloud? Challenge number two is especially about the connectivity between both worlds. So communicating from your data center into the cloud that sometimes works, right? Because you just need to provide that those machines have access to the internet and you don't need to bring basically the other direction. But what in most cases does not work, you are not exposing your system to the internet that you can communicate from the cloud back to on-premise, right? So you need something, and I know you can establish VPN and so on, but those are all solutions who are, let's say, are a little bit hard to establish and are also hard to manage. So you need something maybe more at once in this direction. And the third one is, that even if you have now a Kubernetes cluster that are running on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, you typically don't have integrated user access management and authorization. So you need to log in with a different credentials or with a different user on the one-hand side, and you don't have it on the right-hand side, right? And this sounds, in the first place, maybe very small, but it's actually a problem when it comes to operating those kind of landscapes, right? Because your administrators have to multiple times uh, manage the permissions on the respective clusters. 
So what is a nice thing is that we have a couple of collaborations in these fields. And uh, that's now how we can basically also solve this problem of deploying an enterprise application such as the Data Hub in a hybrid cloud environment. So SAP and AWS are working together for a long time to realize enterprise applications in the cloud and also to run basically SAP workloads uh, on the AWS infrastructure. So that's already good, right? And we are collaborating with Cisco, and Kip mentioned that uh, before, uh, in the hybrid cloud and the on-premise container platform. Oh, hybrid cloud, hmm, that's interesting. Okay, it might be a first place how we can continue with that, because now, with the announcement that was made, we now have also Cisco and AWS collaborating on the hybrid cloud way. So the idea is basically, yeah, okay, easy. Let's join forces from all three companies to have then enterprise-ready hybrid cloud data processing for enterprise companies. So let's have a look how this, how this looks like at the end. So we're coming back to the basic deployment that we have. We have our data hub in the cloud. We have our data hub on premise. And now we solve first the challenge of how we can basically bring an enterprise-ready Kubernetes environment to the on-premise world. We are basically using the Cisco container platform that was introduced by Kip. And we can run with that the SAP data hub on top. So the customers get a turnkey solution. They have to plug in their data center install the data hub on top of that, and they can run this complete environment, this complete enterprise application inside of the data center. And this is, again, I was talking about one hour that it takes us uh, in, the, um, in the cloud. And now if you have this installed in your data center, it takes you one hour also to spin up the whole thing uh, on your, in your customer data center. The second is we have the CSR routers that Kip was mentioning. So we have a secure connection between both environments so that the cloud deployment can access basically the on-premise deployment and the other way around. So we have really native communication and those systems can now interact. I can now basically read my data from my secure system uh, on-premise, anonymize it, and then natively bring it into the cloud for doing machine learning. And the last piece is basically that you can, on the one hand side, you have an integrated management between both sides. So the Cisco container platform can manage the Amazon EKS part. Right? So you're, it's good for your administrators, right? because they just have to fiddle with one system and can spin up in both environments. And you have an integrated user management that I was mentioning in the beginning. So we are reusing the AWS user management and use this one on premise to have just one user management system in the game. OK. So and the data hub, what is this doing the data hub now? The data hub is then basically spanning an orchestration layer across both environments and allow now companies not only on the infrastructure level to integrate and collaborate, but really define now those end-to-end -end pipelines, those end-to-end -end processes of managing data across their on-premise data center and their cloud data center. And I want to show you also how this is working in a, in a, in a live demo. So we are coming now to the, to, the, to the demo part. And yes, I'm taking the risk to do a live demo, but no worries if it's not working, I have also a video with me. So let's, let's see how this whole thing is working. Just quickly for the explanation how it is set up this demo, right? So we have a number of cloud sources in AWS in this case. Um, we will use in this case, just for the example purposes, an S3 storage. We have a couple of sources uh, on premise where we will use for this demo the SAP HANA connection. We have the SAP Data Hub running in both sides. We have the AWS connector operators, which are connecting natively to the services from AWS. And we have the SAP connection framework that is natively connecting to the SAP applications. Now we can basically create a pipeline that is running in the cloud. So we read the files, we query the DB, we transform and filter the data in the cloud, join it, and aggregate it. Why aggregate? I mean, you can imagine that typically when you're running from an S3 data lake or from a sensor stream, you have a, let's say, huge amount of data. And before you send it basically to your on-premise system, you want to bring it to a reasonable size. You don't want to send your terabytes of data to the on-premise system. That's why typically you do the pre-processing, the filtering, the aggregation in the cloud. So on-premise, basically, we are querying our DB for the master data. We also filter the master data to a reasonable size. We read the stream that is coming basically from the cloud over the CSR connection. Then we join both data together, and then we are finished because we have then the data set available that we can use, for example, to visualize, to create reports, or to feed it back to some other systems that you might have. Okay, so we have EKS running, we have Cisco Container Platform running, we have the CSR connection running, so we should be good, right? So let's see 
how and if this is working. So I have to push a button here. Let me see if this is working. Ah, nice. OK, perfect. So we have our S3. And we prepared in the S3 a bucket where we have now a couple of files. So it's, I think currently it's around 200 gigabytes, so not super, super much, but just for the, for the demo purposes. And we can now have a look into this data. So this is data that is coming from a fitness tracker. So all of these just wearables, like the Apple Watch or anything that you might have, and they are basically recording here on this, uh, in, in those files, basically, your heart rate, distance, and speed you are running, right? And what I want to do is basically bring this data together with the data you are, they are having on-premise about the sales for a customer to better group the customers by their running capabilities. So let's have a look how such a file looks like. Let's download it quickly. Yeah, whatever. And then we can have a look at this file. I'll make it a little bit bigger so that you can also see it. So what we have here is now, we have now, as you might have know for sensor data, we have a timestamp, we have a device ID, and we have now a couple of measurements that we can basically read. And that's exactly the measurements that I was mentioning are inside. So you have the pulse, the distance, and the speed. So we can identify now devices that are worn by, um, by customers who are running, for example, as a, let's say, a more, let's say, um, slow runner, right? They might have something with a high heart rate, low distance, and a, a, a low speed, right? A small distance and a low speed. And we might identify now customers who are basically having uh, more in the professional runner scene, right? They are running a long distance with a low heart rate and a higher speed. Okay, so this is how those files are looking like. So now we have two deployments of the data hub. We have one deployment that you can see here that is running on AWS EKS. And we have one data hub that is running on premise, as you can see on the IP address, inside of a Cisco lab. So let's have a look how we can do this whole thing. So here we have now such a pipeline. This is the pipeline in the cloud, as you can see here. So what we're actually doing is we are reading now a file from the S3. Here are our connection properties, how we can read it. And we then feed the file into the aggregator. Right? And the aggregator is doing the filtering and aggregation of these values from the uh, hourly values, in this case, to monthly values, because we want to bring into conjunction the, let's say, average speed, distance, and heart rate with the monthly sales, basically, for those customers. So then this is enqueued in a Kafka producer. And if you look at the Kafka producer, it is basically sending the data to the on-premise Kafka endpoint. Right? You can see it here. This is the IP address, 192.133, et cetera, for exactly this, uh, this, this connectivity. So let's have a look how the data looks like. So here we can, I hope you can see it at least a bit. So we, here we have exactly the data that's coming from the file in an aggregated form. We have the timestamp, we have the device ID, and we have the three values that we are interested in, which is the heart rate, the speed, and the distance that was run in average uh, in a month for each of the sessions that are taken. OK, so let's have a look at our Grafana dashboard, which is basically showing now how uh, the data is enqueued in our Kafka. So we can see here, this is the messages per topic. And we throttled basically the message sending to an average of uh, 40 messages per second. Right? So this is what we are basically enqueuing now from the cloud system into the Kafka that is running on premise over this CSR connection. We have some other parts in what the bytes per topic and the bytes out uh, per topic, basically what we are reading from, from, from this part, right? And then we have now here our on-premise system, right? Which is exactly now the counterpart of that. So we are reading here from the Kafka, right? So this is the Kafka that is running on-premise. Um, we, we query the data based on the device ID now from our um, on-premise uh, master data system so that we can bring the device ID in conjunction with the customer. We join the data together. We filter it. Here an example, we filter, we want the minimum revenue uh, should be larger than 20 in this, in this regards. And then we are showing the system basically here as an output, right? So here is now the data that is coming from the cloud joined together with the data that is running uh, from the system on premise. So again, we have here the timestamp. We have now the user ID in conjunction with the device ID. We have the country 
where basically this runner is located. And we have now the revenue that this, uh, that this customer is doing in a month. We have the, still the heart rate, the speed, and the distance on a monthly granularity. And with that now, we can in principle now visualize and group basically the customers by their running capabilities and see what each customer group in our company is doing uh, in, uh, as revenue within this customer group. And this is especially something where we can then optimize marketing for companies who are doing something like selling those fitness trackers, getting those fitness trackers data, and are, and are selling, for example, fitness equipment to uh, their customers. So this is how an enterprise application is running on top of the infrastructure that is provided from the collaboration of Cisco and AWS. And this enables customers now to create really these overarching strategies across their companies. Right? and run in a really enterprise-ready hybrid cloud mode. And Jeremy Oki uh, is basically with me on stage again, and he will show you now how the enterprise application using this uh, infrastructure, how the infrastructure is broken down and looks like uh, in detail. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank great, you. great demo, appreciate it. So let me give you a couple things real quick. Um, there's been a lot of information for you that stuck with us. It's going to get technical now. What are we kind of showing here? One... There's a couple things by showing SAP in this application we want to kind of point out. One, this is a commercial application that's containerizing. I think a lot of times we think of the move to cloud native and containerized and hybrid cloud, we think a lot of times of custom developed applications. So we are seeing now commercial enterprise off the shelf kind of applications you would buy as an enterprise who are also making this move. So it's not just your developers doing mobility applications. Even we Cisco, we've now launched a platform that we call kind of production grade consistent environment. Even our own products are moving to containerized and Kubernetes based. So for example, in the early next year, our cloud management product moves to being Kubernetes and containerized based. So even in Cisco, we're starting to run our own products on top of Cisco container platform. To the 14% Kip alluded to, we find a lot of times why do we kind of get stuck sometimes making decisions? Data gravity. We can solve networking and security and application performance, but then eventually I can't run this application here. I need to run it over here because I have 20 terabytes a day of, of, of data coming in, and so I end up needing to have run my application adjacent to it. So this is a good application that shows you how we can actually take a piece of the data. There's a second part to that. We find also enterprises may be very familiar with enterprise data, relational data, databases, warehouses. But what happens when we're trying to mix stream data with traditional enterprise data? So the demo with a fitness tracker, for example, is showing you stream data that's coming into an S3 bucket. So you have a lot of edge devices. These are IoT use cases where I need to have a lot of capability at the edge to bring in scale. So AWS obviously brings you a lot of scale at the mobility edge, but I also wanted to then correlate that stream data back to my traditional data warehouses, which was my customer data, my purchase histories with partners. So it was a good demonstration to show you actually we're mix mixing stream data. We're also filtering it down. You may be getting now with IoT devices, your data sets are so large I really want, my, my security officer says the application has to run behind the firewall on premise. So you're then thinking, well, how do I move 20 terabytes a day from AWS on premise to be able to do something smart? So we're actually able to then filter that Kafka producer was using a private IP connection, so the CSR router. How do you, so to the developers, do you maybe really care that it's iOS and iOS on both sides? Maybe not as the developer, but your network guys have a lot of comfort that they have an iOS familiar command line to do Amazon integrated networking that's also communicating over private IP address space. So those are a couple of things we're, we're showing the complexity and why Data Hub's a good example of, of, of um, points out how to fix those problems. So let me flip back here real quick for a second. Oh, we're already there. So real quick, um, in this hypercloud deployment, a couple of things that are also difficult. We're coordinating the identity here. So I'm going to kind of show a handful of things like how the actual interface works, how we're creating the Kubernetes clusters. And one of the things here, we're showing the CSR routers there. We're basically creating that VPN connection, extending your private address space into the public network via Amazon VPCs. You may also be syncing, for example, Active Directory back into Amazon, and now you have IAM roles, your identity and access management. So we're re-consuming back. So if you're, I'm going all AWS, 100% AWS, I'm using IAM for everything. We're bringing IAM capabilities back into the on-premise environment. So the concept of IAM roles, uh, we'll show in a second, is being consumed, okay? 
Um, so first thing, we've got a couple of videos here. I'm going to show some live points as well. So we are able to create clusters from both sides. I saw a lot of hands that said Kubernetes aware. I saw less hands that said we know how to do it on premise. I'm going to show you kind of the ability to do both. Those of you who uh, are trying to figure it out, uh, you can hit your neighbors next to you who said they were Kubernetes experts. So good peer networking here as well. So really what we're doing here is in Container Platform, which is on premise, We've now added the capability to define AWS as an infrastructure provider. So we're building a new provider type in the on-premise environment. You're adding the credentials and the access information to access your Amazon AWS account. And then you're configuring one-to-many EKS clusters, but you're doing it from an on-premise control plane. Okay? So we'll get into kind of why that's beneficial. Side by side, it means I can also do the same thing on-premise. So when we actually build these clusters, we're choosing the provider. Here, we're actually using VMware on-premise, but we're enabling IAM. We're uh, selecting some things like what we want the cluster to be called, and, and et cetera. We'll go into some details there. And so it's given us some capabilities. So let me flip over, and we'll do some actual videos here. And then we'll flip to some live demos. Okay, So we can skip Lars's demo. All right, so we're going through, and we're first using the vSphere on-premise provider. Now, what actually I'm recording here is this is everything we did in our lab to set up what you actually saw Dr. Lars running live. So we're building the Data Hub clusters for the Data Hub application installation. So I'm choosing my data center. This is running in San Jose. I'm choosing a VMware cluster. Because the provider type is VMware, we're showing you a nomenclature that's, that's VMware specific. We're choosing the network. We're choosing the data stores we want. We're choosing the VM template here. Now, we mentioned consistent environment. So let me pause here for a second. Cisco is providing the actual Kubernetes OS image here. So there's some capabilities built into that. I'll go into more detail on that. But when we talk about consistent environment, we're doing the same thing in AWS. So this is an image we provide, which is your, the host operating system that runs Kubernetes. So you that are Kubernetes developers may think, I have hundreds or thousands of containers running. You may not realize, actually, there still is a hardened operating system. Your security guys still want to get visibility to it. They still want to know it's secure. Who's actually patching the host operating system? So that's one thing we're taking on as a responsibility within the container platform product. So we're offering this image that's the host operating system for Kubernetes, both on-premise and in AWS. So that's part of the consistent environment we're promising, is that we're supporting those patch management and lifecycle management of the clusters. Okay, so right now we're just showing creation, but I'll get more into the actual lifecycle management once you've created it as well. Okay, so we're choosing an image. We have lots of them here because it's dev environment. You may only have one or two to pick from. We also then pick things like how many load balancer IPs do we want, how many we don't have a concept of instance types on premise. So you actually can more flexibly pick how many virtual CPUs, how much memory do I want, how many actual worker nodes do I want. So these are the tenant workers where containers run. We also then are giving this Kubernetes as a service. Okay? So your development team may actually want to see a familiar, a familiar Kubernetes environment, just like if they were doing it their own on their laptop with Minikube or something. So what we're really showing here is Kubernetes as a service. This is the interface that they're now consuming. We enabled IAM, and now we're using an IAM role, ARN, that was provided that gives us access. Okay, we're not creating a harbor registry here. So now this is the summary. We're now creating a multi-node cluster, three worker nodes on premise, and now this will be built. Okay, so we're gonna jump to the next. So very similarly, I also needed to build the data hub in EKS. So now I'm choosing the infrastructure provider of an AWS. I see the regions available to me in that account, and I'm giving it a cluster name. So this is 41B. This is the, the, the AWS public cloud side that we just built. Now, I see instance type concepts. So now I'm actually choosing the instance types that AWS offers. These are EC2 instances, and those define the actual resource parameters of the instance. Okay? We still think, same thing, we choose the number of workers that we want. We're choosing things like our public key. You're seeing all the IAM roles right here are being queried from the account. Okay? So our developer admin or our IT ops folks have created roles for us to use in our Amazon account. So you as a user may not have full Amazon console access. You may be only seeing a subset. So here's where you actually may see a Kubernetes admin role that gives you the Amazon EC2 and EKS roles you need, the permissions that basically we need to give you delegated access to just administer and manage EKS. Okay? So now we've got this all set up and we're creating a cluster in EKS. Okay, so now we have two of our clusters that we need. Now, we also may need a registry. So while this runs, I'm gonna talk a bit. Registries can be used for multiple things. For enterprise IT, you may want a trusted source to pull binaries from. 
Okay, so what Lars showed was an S3 or an, an Amazon ECR registry. These are where your developers can pull their binaries from. Okay, so this is a service, a shared service that you may need on premise. Maybe you don't feel comfortable having some of your binaries, your financial institution, your secret sauce, your algorithms for day trading, whatever you have, you may not be comfortable putting out in the, in the public cloud. So you want to keep that on-premise because your security officer says that's the way it's got to be. So we also can build a cluster here on-premise that is your registry where all the binaries can be. Okay, so this can be where Data Hub runs, but this is where your developers can then point their build process and push into a known area. Now, there's a lot of people around the AWS community that do security operations that may verify the images, double check the binaries. Is it actually signed properly by your organization? These are all the things that are add-ons, but the registry itself is a bucket. So what we've done now is created an on-premise bucket of a Kubernetes cluster, and the developer may not have access to this. So like you notice we didn't turn on IAM here because this might just be a shared service. Developers consume this by API, by IP address. But now we've created an on-premise equivalent to what you can get in the cloud with Amazon. Okay. So, a couple things. This is now the control plane for the system. So, I have multiple clusters created. I'm seeing my on-premise environment is showing you the number of clusters I have, the health of them, how many nodes, etc. And I also see the harbor registry cluster that I created. So, this is the single pane of, of view of the world. Now, we also then have a view into VMware. This is running on VMware. So these are virtual machines running on top of a VMware environment. So if you're a VMware administrator, this may be what you care about. These are resources being used and consumed from a, from a larger pool. You as a developer may only care because you get a Kubernetes as a service environment, which was the previous interface, and you may never actually see this. Okay? But ultimately, this is virtualized. Now, next year, we will also have bare metal on-premise, and as the public cloud providers, AWS adds like EKS bare metal, we'll also be able to support other nuances. But right now, you may only be experimenting. Maybe you can't dedicate a $20,000 blade because you're not running 1,000 containers on it. So having a 16 gig, four vCPU virtual machine is adequate for dev. Or maybe you have lots of dev teams. So giving a bunch of small clusters virtualized gives you the full capacity to utilize that $20,000 physical hardware asset on-premise, and you're getting the full utilization of it, okay? So, let's jump to the next video here. We have AWS now. So same thing, in the single pane of glass, I'm showing you the on-premise clusters, and now we're also seeing the AWS clusters. Okay. So the nuances are a little different here. We're seeing the Kubernetes version. We're seeing the Kubernetes platform version. We're making API calls to Amazon EKS and letting it do what it does. The provisioning and everything is being done consuming the EKS APIs. Okay? So we're keeping up with Amazon. So when you actually see what we do, here's the Amazon console. You're actually seeing the clusters we create. So if you are an expert, we had a handful of people that said they were Kubernetes experts, you can actually go into your Amazon console and see all the work as well. So you may be able to go in and tweak it or update tags or whatever you may want to do. Nothing's hidden. If you like the single pane of glass in one product between both, that's Cisco Container Platform, but you also will still see everything deployed natively into the console you may be familiar with. Okay. So finally, I mentioned repositories. So we have two repositories here. We have the ECS repository, okay, and then we also have the Harbor repository. So in both cases, we populated these with the SAP Data Hub binaries, and the installations consumed both of these registries. Because maybe your firewall didn't allow an application installation to pull binaries over from a, an off-premise location like Amazon. Okay, So let's uh, switch to some live here real quick. I'll show you a couple other things. All right. Okay, so live in the same thing you just saw in the video now, I, this is the actual real environment. So we recorded these videos, but I'm actually in the real environment now. So let me show you a couple things that we're not only doing the creation, we're also then doing the ongoing lifecycle management. So once you deploy a Kubernetes cluster and have an enterprise application deployed to it, it's not your DevOps team just doing create and destroy. You actually may need to do things, for example, like add nodes upgrade the environment. Maybe Kubernetes 1.11 becomes Kubernetes 1.12. This cluster was deployed as Kubernetes 1.10. Maybe that's the version that that application vendor says they support. Later, they add support for 1.11. So by choosing, I want to upgrade this to 1.11, you see that we can actually choose the new uh, template, the new operating system image that we provide. You can go ahead and actually 
upgrade. So this is the rolling lifecycle management of the nodes, okay? So the same thing is also available for Amazon EKS. Okay. A couple other things. If you're a developer who's really good in Kubernetes, I said this was Kubernetes as a service. So IT ops, you may not be Kubernetes experts. You want to provide a Kubernetes service that can create hundreds of clusters for different development teams. They may not actually want this interface. Maybe you do the cluster provisioning for them as a self-service function, or they actually do it themselves. Maybe it's a, a ticket they open, that's your process. You have change management. You create it and give them the output. What they may want is the Kubernetes dashboard, okay? So I'm on cluster 41A here. Let me actually go back and show you the harbor, because if you remember on the harbor, we didn't turn on IAM. So normally, I would download a token. This is what the developer would expect. So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna save this token. This is the access material that is normally needed to access a Kubernetes dashboard, okay? So if your developer was used to seeing Kubernetes, they could install something on their laptop from open source, you could pass in this token, and I can sign in. So this may be what your developer gets. You may provision this for them, and you send them an IP address, and the tokens. Their CI CD tool chain may be different from dev team to dev team. So they actually see this Kubernetes cluster as a target. So this is the harbor registry. We probably wouldn't want to give them access other than putting binaries in here. But the point is, I used a standard Kubernetes token uh, environment file to access this. Okay? So now if I go back to Cisco Container Platform and we click on the on premise cluster that we AWS IAM enabled, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to download a token because we do generate one, it's just kind of automatic. But when I click the Kubernetes dashboard, there's gonna be a little bit different behavior. I'm gonna go ahead and specify the other file. It was this one. And when I click sign in, I get an error. Can't create the auth info structure. Kind of generic error message, it's Kubernetes. The reason here is, is that this is I am enabled. So it's not Kubernetes local credentials anymore. Okay, so I actually need something else. I actually need the IAM token from my Amazon account that's then provided to me. So I'm gonna hop out here real quick. Switch off for a second so you guys don't see all the secret passwords. This is being recorded. So I'm gonna go grab this very long key. It's not my first rodeo. I've seen people record and try to hit our websites as soon as we use it. Okay, so I've got the token saved. I'm gonna paste in that very long token and now when I click sign in, I get access, okay? So a couple things here. Um, this is what your developer may be familiar with. So the environment's still provided just like they were. IT ops, I have multiple clusters now. So a couple things are occurring in the container platform. One, we are spinning up Grafana, Kafka, all kinds of services in each cluster. So if the developer wants logging, monitoring, Prometheus, et cetera, they're getting it localized. You as IT ops may want to see all the logging for all the clusters. So the overall platform also provides you Prometheus and Grafana and the logging and monitoring to see everything. But each development team may also get, will get the localized service as well. So container platform is providing that. Okay. Now, if I go back to the Amazon console, I'm using the same IAM role here. So we're logged in as a SAP S3 Data Hub account. If I, for example, go click on IAM roles here, I get a bunch of errors because the role we used when we set up those clusters was fairly limited. Just like if you're just a development team, your IT may not give you full access to everything. They may provide you credentials and provide you an IAM role. So same thing here. We had that ARN that was our Kubernetes admin role, this same account. And what I see when I log in the Amazon console is a fairly restricted view of IAM because my IT folks may be syncing Active Directory, et cetera, into here, okay? So, a um, couple other things here. Um, we showed kind of the upgrade. The health and such shows up here. We can also edit, delete clusters, modify them, add nodes, et cetera, okay? So let me flip back here real quick to another slide. All right, so we've shown a couple things here um, to kind of just wrap it up for everybody. So we've got the on-premise that's launching the clusters, giving you a single view of the world. We're sharing identity with AWS. So if your view is, I'm all in with Amazon, and you like to see everything in IAM roles, then we're actually consuming those on-premise as well. We're providing both container elastic container registry, and optionally, you can have on-premise registry. 
Things like SAP Data Hub also need on-premise object storage. I think you saw a slide earlier that showed um, Scality. That's an S3 emulation on-premise. So Cisco sells hardware, and if you want an S3 API but you need it on-premise, that's part of the solution as well. And so ultimately, we're sharing the RBAC policies. We're providing the full consistent environment experience from on-premise. So with that, I hope this was helpful. Uh, enough technical information mixed in, kind of show you a real-world application. Appreciate everyone coming. Uh, thank you for uh, Kip and Lars for participating, and I hope you guys have a great reInvent. Thank you. <laughs>